Hey y'all, it's me, Kirby Shivers. And today I'm gonna teach you how to dust your blinds. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm gonna tell you true crime. So stick around. So for this week's true crime queen, we're gonna be talking about the case that inspired the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. That's right, we're gonna be talking about the real Emily Rose, Annalise Miko. So in order to talk about Annalise Mikkel, we're going to jump in our time machine and head way back. Way, 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 way back to the 1960s. Annalise Mikkel was born on September 21st, 1952 in Klingenberg, Bavaria. Now, she was raised by a very strict, very conservative, middle-class, devout Catholic family, and according to reports, she wasn't a very popular young lady. She was pale and sickly, but she did well in school, and she focused on her studies. So, Annalise was 16 years old in 1968 when she experienced her first blackout. She was in the middle of class, and and when she came out of it, she was disoriented, but she didn't think much of it. It was just kind of like a weird moment, and she went about her day. It was later that night, however, that things got really scary for Annalise. This was her first episode, so to speak, and she reported experiencing paralysis and suffocation and uncontrolled urination. And with it being 2020 now, we can kind of quickly say like, oh, duh, it's sleep paralysis. It's these night terrors. It's, there's whole documentaries about it. There's research on it. But keep in mind, this was the 1960s and I highly doubt they were jumping to sleep paralysis as the first option, especially considering it wasn't until 1928, according to the PMC US National Library of Medicine, that sleep paralysis was ever even written down or officially defined. So we're only looking at about 40 years here. And while 40 years is a long time, it's also not that long in the medical world, especially back when technology wasn't a thing. So sleep paralysis probably wasn't as widely documented, so to speak. Today it's believed that sleep paralysis affects mostly students due to the high stress situation, the nature of their anxiety, stress disorders, and you know, just going along with being a student, being a teenager is stressful. And so this really fits kind of the narrative that Annalise is starting to follow. While the episode in 1968 did scare Annalise and it was a traumatizing experience, they didn't really do much about it because she wouldn't experience another episode for about a year. And it was the second episode that they finally sought a neurologist and Annalise was diagnosed with a form of epilepsy. But due to the infrequency of the episodes, she was not placed on any medicine. And even though she wasn't placed on any medicines, this diagnosis and her most recent episode of like paralysis really kind of took a toll on Annalise. And this is when her health really kind of began to decline. Whether from stress or a pre-existing condition, with this decline in her health, she was eventually diagnosed with numerous other issues. So she had tuberculosis, tonsillitis, pneumonia, as well as heart and circulatory problems. Due to her declining health and her epileptic episodes, she is sent to a sanitarium in Middleburg, Germany. And at this point, she's 17. She's just trying to figure out what's wrong with her. And on June 3rd, she has another nighttime attack, essentially. She experiences the same thing, paralysis, suffocation, urination, and she is quickly sent to another neurologist. Now this neurologist runs an EEG, and EEGs are used to monitor brain waves, see what's going on up in there, and if they notice anything 
if they notice anything weird, then they're able to treat it and do what they can. The EEG results came back and they were a little bit wonky, so they did once again diagnose her with epilepsy, and this time they prescribed her an anti-convulsant medication. So a medication that was meant to kind of prevent epileptic attacks and stop these nighttime terrors from occurring. At the same time, Annalise is becoming almost like a verbal punching bag for her fellow patients. They would make fun of her, call her like a snot-nosed brat. They would say she was terrifying, sick looking. They would joke and make fun of the fact that they believe she was possessed by the devil or possessed by a demon. So Annalise is falling into this steep state of depression and due to kind of being like the outcast, prayer is like her only sanctuary essentially. And she can't even find solace in prayer because it's when she's praying the rosary that she sees a demonic face for the first time. She reports that when she looked up, she saw a demonic, grimacing, scary male looking down on her. So she becomes scared to pray. I mean, she's scared that the next time she goes and bows her head to pray, she's gonna see this demon again. And this mixed with her fellow inmates taunts, she really believes and starts to think that that demon is inside of her. Despite her increasing depression and her reports of demonic visions, her physical health actually begins to get better. So they see an improvement in her vascular health, they see an improvement in her heart health, in her circulatory problems, and because of this, she is released from the sanitarium. At this point, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that this new Annalise is not the same Annalise that left all those months ago. She's moody, she's distant, she's struggling to focus in school, she's really kind of changed. And at this point, she does begin to experience these epileptic episodes more frequently. They do decide to seek out medical help and they go back to the doctor. Dr. Siegfried Luthi, who actually initially diagnosed her with epilepsy, and at this point, he once again says, yeah, it's epilepsy. I would just recommend anticonvulsants and come back in for frequent checkups and just keep in touch. So Annalise does attend these frequent checkups like Dr. Luthi suggests, but she fails to keep him fully updated. She doesn't tell him how serious and severe the episodes are getting, and she doesn't inform him of her new symptoms. Now that they're becoming more frequent, they're getting worse, and she starts seeing more and more scary demonic faces in her visions. She begins to experience, um, she starts smelling awful, like burning scent, the smell of feces, rotted flesh, rotted meat. No one else seems to smell it. She hears knocking in her room at night, but no one else hears the knocking. It keeps her up. She's stressed, she's not sleeping, she's not eating. It's just like a vicious cycle because because she's not eating, she's stressed. Because she's stressed, she's having these seizures. Because of these seizures, she's experiencing neurological side effects such as demonic visions, demonic sense, scary shit really. It's during these increasing episodes that she does meet Peter, a boy she starts dating. It's just that by all accounts that I read, yeah, he stuck with her through this whole thing, but from Annalise's end, she just isn't able to reciprocate the physical affection or love that you would expect, simply because she's just going through so much emotionally and things just keep getting worse. So one night, Annalise's mom, Anna, reports that she came out 
to the statue of the Virgin Mary that they had in the house. And when she came out, Annalise was standing in front of it with eyes that were pitch black and her hands were paws with claws on them. At this point, her parents decide that they have to do something about it. They can't just keep sitting around. And this is when they decide to take her to the Mother of God of San Damiano in Italy. It's kind of like a pilgrimage almost, like um, a church. You go, you worship, you pray to Mary, you pray to God. And when they get there, Annalise physically cannot enter the church. She says it is physically painful for her to try and cross the threshold. She also complains that the sand on the ground is burning her feet. So at this point, in a deep demonic male voice, she rips off her rosary and she says, It's suffocating me. At this point, kind of everyone in Annalise's life is freaked. They continue to see Dr. Luthi. And they claim that at one point, Dr. Luthi says, if I was you guys, I would go find a Jesuit priest. Now, later, Dr. Luthi will deny saying this, but we'll get to that, well, later. Annalise does begin to visit and consult with numerous priests. Now, not every priest was willing to listen to her story, nor did they necessarily believe what was going on, but at one point she eventually meets Father Ernst Alt. Now, after meeting with Annalise, it is Father Alt's belief that Annalise is suffering from circumcessio, or the problem of being surrounded by evil forces. Now, he would continue to meet with Annalise, and in these meetings they would talk, they would pray, they would discuss what she believed was going on, and it appeared that while temporary, Annalise felt better. And because of her positive reaction to prayer and a religious figure in her life, Father Alt would eventually go on to mention the possibility of an exorcism. Now, it's 1974, the fall of 1974, and this is when he first petitions Bishop Stango to approve the reading of the rites. So basically, exorcisms are performed by reading different rites from different books. And he just wants to do a small one, but Bishop Stengel denies it. He does not think it's a case that warrants it, and he just, no. So now by this point, Annalise has been dealing with this shit for six years. I mean, imagine how desperate you would be. I mean, I get a, like, I have like a sore neck or I have reoccurring nightmares and after like a night or two I'm over it. I'm like dude this has gotta end soon because I'm not gonna keep dealing with this and she was dealing with sleep paralysis, night terrors, demonic visions, knocking noises for six years okay and she's getting desperate and it doesn't feel like any one wants to help her. She's doing what she can. She continues to take this medication even though it doesn't help. She meets with this priest even though it's a temporary relief. But then her grandma dies. And it is the death of her grandmother that really kind of sends Annalise into a downward spiral. So this is when things get pretty bad. Annalise, at this point, believes she is eternally damned, and she doesn't know why, though. She tells Peter that she's not sure why, and she's not sure what sins she is answering for. But during this, she stops going to church. She just physically cannot take the pain that comes with attending church. She begins to develop an aversion to all things holy, 
Um, so any crosses hanging up in the house, any holy photographs, relics, anything like that, she just can't bear to be around them. And the seizures, they start becoming more and more violent with her like thrashing, with her up and down, up and down, up and down, banging her head against the wall. Peter said he would wake up in the middle of the night to her having a seizure and her body would contort and her face would contort and it was so unnatural and so unnerving. And this is when he would tell people that he really believed Annalise was possessed. These episodes not only were violent for Annalise, but eventually became violent for others in her life. Um, she would begin to break things and throw things with numerous reports of her throwing stuff at Peter and shouting shit, swearing, cursing people. On July 1st of that year, Father Alt would visit Annalise and he found her in a hysterical state. In his mind, he knew prayers because he's a priest. And he began to mentally say the prayer of exorcismus probatium, which I'm just, I'm assuming is like a basic exorcism prayer. And at this point, according to him, Annalise reacted violently. She immediately jumped up, ripped off her rosary and began screaming. And after this visit is when Annalise really got worse. She was screaming at people. She was cursing people. She was hurting herself. She was starving herself. She began to exude an awful stench and no one knew what was going on. And because of how bad things had gotten, Annalise had written a letter to Father Alt. Among it, she knew that she was suffering for something and she didn't know why. And she said, I want to suffer for others, but this is just so cruel. Because yeah, like in a lot of faith-based practices, they do have this idea of like repentance or suffering for sins and you just kind of endure it and you move on and you're blessed because of it. But to her, this was way beyond the scope of any suffering she thought she would ever have to do. Once again, Father Alt went to Bishop Stangl and after discussing how desperate Annalise was getting and how bad it was getting, Stangl approved the reading of the Ritual Romanium or in English, the Roman rituals. And it's basically a book of rites that are to be read at an exorcism. With finally gaining the bishop's approval on September 24th, 1975, Father Alt with the enlistment of his fellow colleague, Father Arnold Renz, went and performed the first exorcism on Annalise Mikau. Now, according to them, she would speak in different voices. She bucked like a goat. She would contort her body. She howled like a dog. She would scream when holy water was sprinkled on her. Shortly after, on September 28th, they would perform the second exorcism and she reacted just as violently. And it was this time that they decided to record every single exorcism from here on out and miraculously those audio tapes do still exist in these audio tapes Annalise, uh, well, not just in the audio tapes, but the audio tapes prove it, Annalise announced that she was possessed by multiple demons. Now, these demons included Judas, Lucifer, 
Hitler, Cain, Nero, and Fleischmann, who was a fallen priest. When they looked into these demons, obviously, some of them are obvious. Lucifer, Nero, obviously demons. Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. And Fleischmann was the one that shocked them the most. They called this one the dark one or the black one because when research was done on him by Father Alt, it was discovered that he was a fallen priest from way long ago who was an adulterer and was just all around a bad person. And Annalise really would have had no no knowledge of him. So this is kind of when they were like, okay, Hitler makes sense. It was very recent in Germany. And Cain makes sense because Cain was Abel's brother. And Judas makes sense because Judas, you know, Jesus. Lucifer, Jesus. It just didn't make sense how she would know Fleischmann. So they were like, that's a little weird. And in her moments of like cognitive awareness, Annalise would say that like, Shh, this was all terrible, but in the middle of it, Jesus would visit her and let her know that you will be greatly rewarded for the suffering. I know the suffering is bad, but you will be greatly rewarded and one day you will be a saint. And this gave Annalise almost like a new sense of like, let's do this shit. Only she probably wouldn't say shit because she's Catholic, but. So this next part's a little too coincidental for me, but I'm not here to judge. Well, okay, I am a little bit here to judge, but I'm just here to tell the story. So on October 31st, Halloween night, of course, 1975, this is the night that they believed they successfully exuded all six demons. According to Father Alt, they had performed multiple exorcisms and all six had been expelled from her body and they knew this because each time she was violently vomiting, screaming, speaking in different voices and it was when all six left. They said a final Hail Mary and they thought this was over but boom, bang, another demon was like, surprise, <laughs> it's me, I. This demon just went by I and claimed to have been purposefully lurking and hiding deep within Annalise so as not to be exuded. Expelled? Yeah. So this was like a little bit of a false sense of hope for them. They thought they had done it, but they didn't. And because of this, their exorcisms would continue. So in the span of about 10 months, from 1975 to 1976, about 67 exorcisms were performed on Annalise, about two a week, each lasting for up to four hours. At some point during these exorcisms, it's believed that Annalise told her loved ones, uh, specifically her parents and Peter, that they should just calm down because come July, this whole ordeal would be over, her suffering would be over, and they wouldn't have to worry about this anymore. And because of this, this is when the priest started to think this might be a penance possession. Now, penance in religious terms is when you basically atone for your sins. You, a penance is a, basically like a punishment, I would say. And unfortunately, penance possessions are that much more difficult to attend to. So these active exorcisms have been going for about a year at this point. And by June of 1976, Annalise is physically declining. As she's weighing close to nothing, her skin is like bruised and mottled, she can't eat, she can't keep food down, she just is suffering. And it's at this point that her parents are like, 
do you want to go to a doctor? And she says, no, at this point, there's nothing a doctor can do for me. She says, I've accepted my punishment and I accept the fact that I have to atone for the youth of the world. And she realizes that once she has atoned, she will be blessed and she will go down in history as a martyr. Instead of visiting a doctor, all she does is ask for Father Renz to give her absolution. And on June 30th, 1976, he agrees, he comes over and he gives her absolution. Unfortunately, Annalise was correct about the fact that her ordeal would be over come July, and on July 1st, in the early morning, she died in her sleep. Her family quickly rushed to get a death certificate and list the death as natural causes, but when the family doctor showed up, they said there was just no way that they could list Annalise as natural causes because there was no way that she died of natural causes. She only weighed 68 pounds. She had two broken knees. You only have two knees and both of hers were broken because of the constant genuflections that she would experience. And it was said that she also contracted pneumonia. Now, the official autopsy report said that she did die of starvation, and I believe that. It didn't take long for the Mikels and the two priests involved, Father Renz and Father Alt, to be charged with negligent homicide. The trial started on March 30th of 1978, so just about two years after Annalise's passing and is said to be one of the biggest trials in German history, second only to the Nazi trials. So that's a pretty big deal. And it wasn't a trial by jury, it was a trial by court only, which I thought was interesting considering it's like one of the biggest trials in German history. The fact that it wouldn't be in front of a jury, but I don't know, I don't know how it works. During the trial, the Doctors who testified actually testified that Annalise was not possessed at all. I mean, like I said, it's 2020 and we can kind of see the forest through the trees, but her family couldn't. And of course, the stuff happened to her is terrifying. According to doctors, it was just psychological effects of being raised in such a strict religious upbringing mixed with the side effects of her epilepsy and the medication she was on. This is when it was brought to light that Dr. Roth, someone who had worked with Annalise closely and had attended numerous of her exorcisms, was actually quoted by the family as saying that when we're when Annalise cried out for medical attention, he responded saying, there is no shot against the devil, Annalise. And like I had said, of course, he denies saying this. He claims he told the Mikels to seek other medical treatment and see other doctors and they didn't listen. The Mikels were represented by a church-sponsored lawyer, which is not shocking. The church wants to protect them. Obviously, they're devout Catholics, and I've said devout Catholics about, I don't know, 52 times this video. And of course, they were kind of in this predicament because of the church, so they were provided with a church-sponsored lawyer. Now, this lawyer argued that, and given the time period, it's 1978, Exorcisms were not illegal, so to speak, and the family was protected by the German constitution and the right to an unrestricted exercise of religious beliefs. Essentially saying like, because the exorcisms were kind of um, performed due to religious beliefs, you can't really punish them. But, I mean, they could, and they did, and we'll get there. But according to Bishop Stengel, he, he would have never approved these exorcisms had he known of her alarming physical condition. 
Before the verdict was read, the state, who were the prosecutors, well, because it was the state versus the Mikels, they recommended that the involved parties, so the priests, Father Alt and Father Renz, be slapped with a fine, and that the parents of Annalise Mikel get away with nothing. Because the state believed the parents already suffered enough, and really the fine should fall to the priest. However, when the verdict came through, it was a six months jail sentence and three years probation for both the Mikels and the priests involved. Now this was a little bit of a shocking verdict because it was less than people expected, but more than requested. So I know that's kind of like a tongue twister, but like I said, the state didn't expect as much of a punishment and didn't even really request as much of a punishment, but the public expected more of a punishment because like I said, even though this isn't like a jury trial and it's not recorded for the media, it's still one of the biggest cases in German history. After the trial commenced, the Mikels kind of wanted to prove that they weren't really batty, religious, devout Catholics. They weren't like negligent assholes like people were making them out to be. And so they requested that Annalise's grave be exhumed. Now, exhumation can happen for multiple reasons, and especially when cases go cold and they need to like re-examine evidence, whatever. So in order to kind of petition for an exhumation, you need a reason. So the Mikels said that the reason they wanted an um they wanted to exhume Annalise's body is because of how hastily she was buried. It was believed that like, because of how quickly this all went down, she was buried in like a really cheap coffin and they just wanted to respect her and bury her in something a little more expensive. Of course, they also had this side agenda of kind of proving that Annalise was possessed. And this is when they were also like, oh, at, by the way, if you exhume her and her body doesn't show signs of natural decomposition, she was possessed and we were right. However, once the body was exhumed, Annalise's body did show signs of normal decomposition and this was kind of the end of the argument that she was possessed and kind of the acceptance of she was just a sick girl. She had psychological disorders from a mix of her parents, from a mix of her religion, from epilepsy. And she was eventually reburied in an oak coffin, a much nicer oak coffin that was lined with tin to kind of protect and preserve. Now, Annalise's gravesite kind of became, and to this day really remains, a sort of pilgrimage. Now, pilgrimage is basically like a site that religious people go to, specifically Catholic, I believe. People go to to kind of pray and worship and visit like a holy, a holy sanctity, essentially. And this really kind of solidified her prophecy. The prophecy that according to her, Jesus visited her during her, one of her episodes and told her that one day she would be a martyr and she would be a saint. And with her gravesite turning into a holy pilgrimage, it kind of solidifies that idea. So she had that. It's interesting to note that Considering when you look at the details of Annalise's case, it's very similar to The Exorcist. Now, The Exorcist came out right around the time that Annalise and her like epileptic episodes really became violent and demonic. So some do think like subconsciously 
she was harboring these fears. So it wasn't like the exorcist was just some little one-off. I mean, I mentioned the exorcist and you instantly know what I'm talking about. And some believe that due to the popularity of the exorcist, the book, the movie, both huge hits, Annalise had these subconscious fears that came to light in her dreams, in her epileptic episodes, and she kind of unknowingly manifested this. It's also interesting to know, one of the demons that she reported being possessed by was Hitler. And like I said, she grew up in Germany, and that was kind of how they brushed off this possession was, duh, it's Hitler. She just spent how many years watching the trials of the Nazis, learning about Nazi Germany and Hitler and the awful shit he did. Plus, in some of the recordings, Annalise is recorded as kind of saying like, She's talking about herself because in these recordings, it's believed that she's possessed and she's the demon speaking through Annalise's body. But as the demon, she calls herself a snot-nosed brat or like a snot-nosed sniveling little girl. And if we go all the way back to one of her first episodes when she was in the sanitarium. These are these same names that her fellow patients kind of rallied against her and called her. And these are the names that she used against herself. Now, whether this is once again like a subconscious thing, like a, that's what I believe it is. I believe that given the evidence of the time she grew up, the cultural significance around when she grew up, and the words she used for herself, this was more of like a subconscious possession. Now, even though I think it was a subconscious possession, did it scare the shit out of me while I was researching it? Yes. Because, like I said, I was up till about 11.30 at night researching this, and when I went to bed, I truly thought I was gonna wake up and be possessed by a demon. <laughs> but I woke up, I was not possessed, and I'm here recording this video. All right, everyone, that's it for our discussion on Annalise McCall and the real life exorcisms that inspired Emily Rose. In the comments, go ahead and let me know, do you think this was real? Do you think this was all psychological? Do you think it was side effects? Do you agree with the outcome of the trial? Go ahead and comment your opinions. Let me know what other stories you want me to cover, what other type of videos you want to see. And while you're at it, go ahead and hop on over to your Instagram app and follow me at it's me, Kirby Shivers. And yeah, subscribe, stick around. I will be back next week with another new episode of True Crime Queen. All right, thanks, bye.